Hello, Katia. This is uh, Stalker Magazine from Finland. And, Hello. Uh, yeah, um, congratulations with your new record. Thank you. And so nice to see you again. I remember our interview last year when I was just in the middle of making the, the record in Helsinki, Finland. So it's actually good to, to speak again. The response have been really great so far with Saula. Since we are talking after the release, uh, how it is now, like how it was re received? Well, it's it's always a little bit hard to foresee, of course. Uh, the first response was actually mind-blowing because, uh, yeah, it was by, by kind of like a very established uh, music magazine and uh, they used the word masterpiece. So uh, me and also my uh, co-producer, Yanni Peo, we just fell from our chairs like, that's not a word you often hear. So that was really lovely to 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 have as sort of like the first moment of receiving feedback. But it also made me realize that I was a little bit, uh, well, not scared, but a little bit uh, vulnerable in a sense for receiving uh, the feedback because I really did put everything in there uh, that I had to offer right now at this point in my life. Like, music quality wise production quality wise um and content wise uh so yeah i just hope of course that people will resonate with it but um yeah it is kind of fragile to put yourself out there so so much like i really put everything in there but on the other hand then i also think well no matter how it's received it, i will accept it you know this is the best i could do now so <laughs> But actually, response has been since then, uh, yeah, beyond our expectations. So uh, I do get the impression that people resonate with the material. And of course, it's very diverse on the album. Like we go in different modes uh, according to this thematics of this album, where we have these nine daughters of Ran and they each represent kind of like a different internal emotion or situation of conflict as well. So there's something in there for everyone in that sense as well. So, yeah, but it's been, overall, it's been good. Why uh, do you think it took nine years to make that? Well, uh, it's because I didn't even know what I was starting on when I set out. You know, I I had a vision to want to do an album with this thematic uh, because I had taken up on me to have this artist's name, which is also rooted in some personal family history of mine with the Ran surname via my mother's line, actually. Um, and then I, it was actually that time, that long ago, uh, when I dove into this whole Nordic mythology even deeper, uh, I was already in the middle of making, uh, you know, loose and releasing that and having put my nose into all these folkloric elements of Scandinavia. It was just like a natural progression to want to go deeper into the content of this Nordic literature and to try to understand it as well. Um, but also during the years it took to create Sala, I learned to do audio production and to do my own, you know, proper pre-productions. And so to learn studio skills, uh, how to self-record, how to really properly do all that because I've also learned that working with my producer friend, Christopher Yu at the time, I just felt so good being in the studio environment and so uh, massively interested in all the nitty gritty things like each little clog in and each little sound wave, you know, alteration that it was also a journey of self discovery of sorts and understanding that oh, it's not only this lyrical and poetic side that I really enjoy as an artist. 
I actually really enjoy also to create soundscapes and to be a storyteller with that tool. But in order to tell my story, you have to sort of first learn to, to well, I won't say master yet because I, I'm not there yet, but you have to sort of learn to use that tool besides playing all your instruments, of course, and singing. So it was kind of a lot. Um, of course, uh, it could have been probably sped up, sped up have I had collaborated with other producers before or signed a record deal earlier for this album. Uh, but I think it was really uh, good that it took so much time because that means I could really churn off the material. I could grow as an artist. I could sort of expand myself into these sounds on so many levels. Uh, not just the song or the lyrics, but also to say, okay, how am I going to approach this? If I want to record something like that or want to have a sound like that, how am I going to go from A to B? Um, so for me, Saula is also a record where I'm really learning actually to be fully myself on a record and to have, even though I still did this now together with Ayani Peu to finish it up, like I still needed a lot of his input there practically speaking, but but as an artist to be secure in myself. So to make the final calls also, uh, so that I can really shape the sounds and the songs to that uh, vision and story I have in my mind. Because uh, as an artist or as a dreamer, I always have like really big visions, like the sky is the limit for me. So. How do we put that into practicality and uh, into products and actually make the product? Nine years, yeah. It's it's good that it's it's a, it's a lucky number according to Agent Edda. So, <laughs> since you have so many musicians in the album, uh, you I feel that you are more like a person who not just creates a sound, but you sort of organize n not just uh, recordings of the instruments, but you kind of add humans to that process, how was it for you like to manage uh, all those bunch of great musicians that contributed to the record? So much fun. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is this is a little bit uh, sort of a, a collaboration between me and the universe of sorts because I can think it, I can have the vision like, for example, I knew that I wanted to have the album open and close with the sound of Bukovan, this traditional gold horn from Norway, a beautiful sound that's used throughout the ages. And for me, making an album that is so focused on this Nordic cosmos of sorts, uh, to open and close it, uh, especially with the idea of first calling in the listener and then at the end of the album, letting them go again. So calling and sending, that kind of aspects of using the horn as well. Eh? more spiritual practices. I knew I wanted to have that sound, right? But I'm not a book of one performer myself. Uh, so, of course, then for me uh, to sort of curate this album, I thought I asked one of the most legendary people <laughs> uh, because I shoot for, for, for the highest goal, right? I can always ask other players who I know will be good and they will be good, you know, and, and, and otherwise we, we make it sound good. <laughs> There's many tricks to studio that can be done there too. But, but I, I also wanted to give sort of tributes and honor to someone who is carrying that culture of the North in the present time. So curating that, and he's just an example. I asked Carl Seglen, uh, jazz and folk, uh, bookhorn performer and multi faceted artist actually from Norway because he's he's one that carries that tradition so for me to have this energy on the on the record also gives sort of tribute to like I see what you're doing I know you're carrying that tradition for me it's it's having a little bit of the essence of Norway literally on the record so it's an energetic thing and with that kind of way of putting in these guests as as a constellation for me uh, that's how I approach it. So it's not necessarily, oh, this is a famous person, but it's more like, do they carry the tradition or do they carry the instrument? Or is their voice precisely the type of energy that 
this song right now is asking for. And so I also have guests out there who are really not that well known, but who are really carrying what they're doing on the record. So I have these beautiful top liner vocals by uh, Xiomara from the UK. And even though she's like an expert in what she does, she's not necessarily very well known in the folk music uh, genre of sorts. But I know that her energy definitely will bring that, you know, that ego slight kind of feeling on the record. And I do also only invite them if it's something I really cannot do myself because I, on the record, did many different types of vocals for myself and try to really, yeah, some songs have so many layers of actually just my voice in a different range or in a different harmony underneath myself. But sometimes you really want to go for having a different voice uh, in, in to really expand a chorus, to make it feel naturally big. And it won't ever feel naturally that big if it's just like 15 layers of the same singer, even if it's different ranges. So that's also like a music producer kind of knowledge to say we actually need a difference in voices sometimes to give that organic wider pan feeling. So yeah, in any case, to come back to your to your original question, it's been really exciting. I feel very blessed to have these guests on the album. Uh, but they they are there for a reason. It's 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 literally what the song means, asks for like best to have like oh, I need to have now like a lower, lower male vocal. Oh, I this re- this song really wants a comfort bass. So then we pre write the melody maybe for that comfort bass. But there a, a real player has to perform it, as so. Well. Then we ask Borga Magnusson, who carries that instrument so well for, for the Icelandic folk tradition. So it all has a reason. And uh, it's to summarize, it's an energetic thing. And it's also a very practical thing. I don't play 40 instruments myself. I play a lot, but not that many. And I want my instruments to be real on my record. So we we exchange uh, virtual instruments for real players to, to make a record. And I think... It also has to do with the fact that I'm a solo artist. Like I don't have a band that can fulfill that role, but to to do, you know, the typical low bass end or like they they are the drum section, they are the guitar section. So I I have to be creative there, and I have to invite people in if I want to make the record that I always have envisioned. I really like uh, was curious about the Tlava marimba because I don't know how you ever come with uh, idea to get such an instrument. I didn't know that such thing exists. Um, you're referring to the stone marima that we install pillars. This was recorded in Iceland. Um, this is also something with this nine year process of making a record. Um, I heard uh, the song uh, Odin's Raven Magic from Steiner Andersen and Hilmar on Helmersen and Sigurós together. And that was one of my loved songs it still is today i think it's a beautiful song it's performed by this traditional rino singer from from iceland and they have this really intense sound on that song specifically it's the only time it's been really properly recorded for a song and that is a marimba made of stones from iceland and each stone on the instruments is laid in a different like tall like according to our musical skills. And so that's also how, how this instrument is being made. It's being done by Paul Gudmundsson, an artist, cool song from Iceland who lives in the countryside and, and goes out on hikes and collects these so- stones specifically for the tonality that they have. And then he makes this huge instrument from it. And so. It also took nine years in a way to go from I love this song with this sound. It's so special. It's someone who makes a, mu- a music instrument from stones in Iceland in a barn <laughs> to actually recording and releasing your own track with it because I needed to find him. I needed to find out if the instrument was still in existence. I needed to have a translator, to a local translator to help me make contact with him, to talk to him, to explain my idea of 
can I please record with this amazing sound with you? This song, this sound, it's so beautiful. Let's do something beautiful with it. Let's recreate another song. And then, of course, having the opportunity, uh, practically as well as financially, to actually go there to travel with a driver friend uh, to the countryside, to bring all my microphones and audio interface, like all the stuff you need for remote recordings, my computer in my backpack there and record with him on the song, which of course was already in a reproduction stage where it was easier to add on guests like that with pre-arranged melody. But still, it, it yeah, the whole journey itself has become sort of part of what Saula, this record is about. Sometimes a certain topic in a song takes a long time to process a certain emotion needs to be sort of digested or you need to take an effort to alchemize one thing into another. And so for this song where we have this Don Marimba uh, sort of featured as, as, as a special instrument, the song itself also is really one of the more intense songs that this album sort of asked of me to deliver. Uh, it asked me to be a lot more vulnerable by doing uh, lyrics in English, which everybody can understand. And uh, the, the content of the song is also a lot about a really intense journey to, to process some, uh, some things that I actually had in my life uh, happening, but also to, to go into such a big topic where you, you feel like, am I losing my mind? feelings of injustice, uh, touching upon topics like the old thing or the uh, the need room or the serious prophecy of, of the Volva, the female character in the Nordic mythology that is taking on them this role to prophesy. So it was already the song that we used this Stone Marimba for was already a very intense one thematically to, to create and to perform and then to have the story of the time it took to get this instrument on that song specifically, it, that just makes it together one of those, I would say, gems on the album because it really could not have existed without being very persistent and at the same time very trusting that if you really have something in your mind, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. It's kind of cliche, but if you can dream it, if you to, to work with an instrument like that, to have it on your own song, you can achieve it. It might still take you some effort. Uh, of course, we used many different studios. Like I traveled to Denmark with Christopher Yule. I traveled to Finland and Norway and Netherlands with Jani Peu. I traveled to Iceland myself. I worked with Mio Torensen, like a master studio. It's also called Master Key Studios, like a, a master recording engineer and producer as well. Like he, he has worked with my all time heroes. So I've actually been in beautiful studios for this production throughout these nine years, because it was also the journey of going to these places and, you know, having a Icelandic band and music ensemble choir of ladies singing on, on there, you know, you need a professional room for that. You need multi-track live recordings at the same time to have those group harmonies uh on the record uh as a group not as individual individual recordings and yeah it's been so beautiful but such a massive undertaking and uh uh it's also very interesting to see the differences in what happens in what kind of uh room you're recording like it sort of adds to to the record as well like we went from I went into really posh recording spaces to uh, sort of more like the the crummier abandoned uh, abandoned building rehearsal band rooms, you know, like it. We've seen all sculpts uh, to to sort of like a um, bedroom, what they call bedroom studio recordings, or like uh, very very uh, private vocal recordings. Um, in the bedroom, like uh, of an apartment, like uh, where you don't actually hire an expensive studio to be able to 
just focus, have a really good microphone, of course, but to just really focus on what you're doing with that uh, when you're in those emotions for a song. So the, the record has seen different spaces to record. And all of those spaces bring in their energy as well, as well as the nature, of course, and uh, recordings in nature. So it's, it's yeah, it, it's just been so much fun uh, to to do that, to uh, have a record that that is also sort of reflective of all your own journeys. And so everyone I met during that process, during those years, whether that was a good conversation I had with someone on on the corner of a medieval market street or, you know, on a festival, uh, whether it was like a helpful tip I've gotten from a friend among the world or meeting a painter or tattoo artist, everything has sort of contributed. And because I was always on the lookout, you know, like, is this person, is, is this tip, is this idea ending up on the record or not? Maybe. So that that's interesting. So some people might not even be aware that they even have helped shape the album uh, just by having a good talk with me on a, on a very obscure topic of sorts. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. And it kind of gives a picture of how endless is art, actually, because like you bind together the different soundscapes and different uh, ways to produce sound, which is like limitless. I think the record is indeed very, very good. Maybe you can uh, tell a little bit about uh, one or two songs that you like the most. And maybe I'm curious about Salah, uh, the opening song. Uh, I really like it. It's like this has a nice beat in it. And it's like, it's that chorus that many people come together. It's like, if I may say, it's like a ceremonial sound that gets that vibe to it. <laughs> so what what is the song about? Uh, what well, Saula, uh, the opening song is of course also the title track. Uh, but it is I I really like that you reflected on the fact that it feels a little bit like a ceremonial song because I tried to uh, incorporate it um, as like a riding out, like we enter the journey kind of uh, song. Of course, we use some ideas where we're mixing the oceanic element and the canning of ships as horses that are often prepared. A lot of ships were in Viking time were called horses. So I also have this picture of this rider riding out, this like Odinic figure. And um, it's actually one of the few songs where main body of content of the lyrics in question are actually from ancient uh, Nordic literature and text sources. So we have Podex, Regius, uh, Havamal uh, lines in there and also from other uh, sources. And so what I've done here is that on the topic of friendship and maintaining friendship uh, and as well sort of like the meet maiden ceremony, like the the mead cup bearers, these ladies who bring this sacred cup of mead around during ceremonial work or the mead greeting when you receive a guest in your home or in your um, uh, temple. You know, I ha I sort of combined that. So all the, all the components about riding out and taking good care of friendship and making sure there's no grass growing on the path to your friend, right? So like stay in contact, contact often and, and nurture those relationships that you really want to nurture and the importance of that. I think it's, it's still relevant today, especially now with the digital era. We have sort of scattered our attention over so many platforms and people and relationships that Maybe we can lose track of that's what is really precious and important. And and so I felt Saula was, was kind of a, a good opening song for this album because later in, in the record, there are moments of, of grief or hurt or betrayal uh, on all these kind of like circles of relations that one can have in their lives. 
uh, from their closest to more distant people. So having having that as a sort of foundational setting as a title track was was important for me. And then having the meat or bear maidens, uh, like having that ceremonial aspect in there, uh, as well as a galder that I've written based on Nordic literature sources, uh, performing that with Gal together, like that's more like the darker part of the song. Uh, even though the color isn't dark because we're actually exchanging good wishes and, and good fortunes and <laughs> exchanging secrets of sorts. That's actually what we're singing about, you know, having, having all those components and, and ceremonial components is, is sort of stemming from the base idea of to sanctify certain friendships and relationships and and also to be wary of potential misuse like there's a to to illustrate how deep this album sometimes goes also with field recordings there's a moment where our guest uh, Geldir Janis and Baradsma uh, sings uh, he, he sort of goes back to that first verse in uh, Halmal about um, you know going out on the journey and, and to, to visit your friend and then I in the background I'm whispering and I'm whispering another verse and half of my words like you have to be careful you know before you enter someone's stead you know what could be their intentions or is, is no danger lurking uh, just around the corner or like so it, it illustrates that okay also be aware of people's intentions maybe but the knock in that that knocking on the door is actually it's also a knock that I recorded on a door in a little town called Kravik in Norway in 2015, 2015 when I was building my Kravik Lira with Sverre Heimdall and I he took me to this beautiful building that still has a wooden dragon carved in there. Very rare to see that, very hidden. And also a uh, door, it's called Odin's door because it has, it's it's really from, uh, like it's the oldest farmstead in the region. And it has this Odin mask on the door. I was like, I have to knock on this door and record it now. And I remember Sverre Heimdall, uh, the graphic builder uh, guide friends of mine now, looking at me like this lady, she's, she's a bit funny. She's a bit weird. She's. <laughs> <laughs> and so all those years later, when I'm doing the song Saula, of course, when I'm singing or whispering uh, behind Galder's uh, vocals about friendships, they're be careful if someone is lurking in the corner, I, I'm knocking on the door, that sound, and I'm, of course, reusing that sound that I recorded in 2015. So for me, that's like, I don't know, I just go so deep into these sounds with like, all these like little elements and of course I know them. I like sharing about them, not all of them. Some I keep of course to myself, but uh, it is a ceremonial song and it is about friendship. And I really love the, the golden that we've crafted because it was already in the source material, the original source material. It was so evidently a part of any sort of magical component of text. It just literally needed like one or two words and it would be a for Galder. So it was fun to add that in. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful song. Well, that's more about Saula. <laughs> and I really can relate. Like when you see something, you something that is part of some object. And yeah. It's like the wheel to take a little bit with you, like to integrate it somehow. And you had an opportunity with the recording the sound of it. As a photographer, I would be like probably taking a lot of pictures. You can imagine the situation with my producer friend Janu, Jani. <laughs> when I say I have this recording for, from 2015 and we were going to put it in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, but I, I like that. And I think that's, that's important for other artists and songwriters to um, and also artists in other uh, professions, actually, like photography or drawing or like anything can be your inspiration. And I think 
it just adds something of a deeper layer to your work to so sort of have that kind of a collector uh, mindset of sorts. You know, if the opportunity occurs and you're in a special location, is there a way to preserve something from it so that you can put it in your art later? Well, for me, that's something I like to do. And with, with the song Saula, it, yeah, I approach it also a bit ceremonial. Like my whole vocal performance is super ceremonial. You can almost imagine me as like a da -da 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 -da, like like a priestess of sorts. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, it had that mindset during recordings. And with other songs on the record, yeah, there's so many. Like I like them all. They all have stories attached to them. So... <laughs> I'm curious about a song called the 16. Why called the 16? Why it's like this is the numbers there? Yeah, that's for some things. Some things we keep for, for, like we won't it over explain it. Uh, but it might be very much uh, in your face for people who are on the lookout for that sort of content. So. Yeah, 16, of course, it is also a special number, you could say, in Nordic literature or any anyone who's busy with Nordic uh, teachings of sorts. And uh, and I took at least uh, one, one of the most obvious ones is that I took 16 female names in the chorus. Uh, the song actually ended up on the record. We were working on this song as a pre-production for... E and I album to also a project I've been involved in. And I was, of course, to working with Johnny on my record at the same time. And uh, well, I'd laid down some really nice Nick and Hart Bob tune, uh, tune that Johnny has had written there. And when we were working on Saula as well, uh, it became sort of obvious that that song needed to become part of Saula. Uh, it, it really would fit into the whole album even a little bit more perhaps than in uh, the material we were both writing together then at that time for E&I album two because it was already a unicorn in that sort of uh, list of songs we had. Um, and so expanding on, on the feeling that was in that song already from from its root, which was which was actually a dream, yeah, a dream about dead women. I really felt let's tie it in with um, with Kolga because I already had some lyrical material for Kolga, and uh, and so I added those lyrics um, and sixteen female names, and it reflects a lot on the feminine role actually in Nordic myths. Um, a little bit also, unfortunately, in, in our history, which is often recorded by men at the time, um, but also just in, in folkloric stories, like in, in mythological stories, the function of the female, you know, she's, she's always categorized as, you know, the princess or the witch, or uh, they very often in, in old tales are making sacrifices, personal sacrifices for the betterment of the story or the hero. Um, so it's it's definitely reflecting on death and sacrifice that a lot of women have made throughout the ages. And yeah, the sort of collective uh, weight and grief that, that uh, womanhood was carrying. So if we're taking it away from any mythological characters and just look at uh, womanhood throughout the ages and how our roles in history all have always been a little bit on the sidelines, but so important, actually, um, whether that is in a folkloric tale, you know, to help the hero or um, whether that is, you know, if we look at a little bit more the before the Christian conversion, if the lady had still like uh, the ability to be in the role of a seeress of sorts or a priestess, um, prophesizing perhaps the weather conditions, you know, which of course takes a very good observant eye to be able to see weather patterns um, and, and 
than of course to be able to predict it or to be put in the role of almost a detective trying to solve a murder case of two little boys, you know, by contacting the spirits and talking to to, to that spirit. So, so the role of women have changed so much throughout history. And there was also a time where that was forbidden again, you know, where that sacred uh, femininity was, was so much repressed. And Kolga 16, I think you can also hear it in sort of the the key that was chosen for this for this song it's it's very epic pink but it's very uh, melancholic like it 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 can feel like a death march or a death sleep and uh yeah i tied it in also to personal dealings with uh losing someone you love or grieving something maybe even grieving a former personality of yourself. So that, that can really be as big or small as people want to take it. Uh, but for me, I, on a personal level, of course, I did put a lot of tying of lyrics and writing poetry for this song to, to, uh, to a sort of bigger T of female persecution and also the witch burnings and how you know, speaking your speaking your truths and speaking from a place of strength can actually get you killed, can be a reason for people to cut you off or ostracize you or uh, in, in olden times, but sometimes depending on where you are in the world, even present times, literally can get you killed if you're strong in your womanhood and and speak your truth. So it's it was a necessary song to make and a necessary topic to touch upon. If you look also at, of course, the thematics of this album, the arch of it all, the goddess of the sea around and her nine daughters and the way the, that Ran goddess is also depicted in uh, Nas mythology, how she's really put away as the sort of evil man grabbing man seducing rusts and robbery of the sea right so why is that made to be feminine <laughs> like... and i understand that the whole album is kind of quite a lot about the feminine side right yes and i think that's that's also because it comes from a woman I mean, when I go through all this material, I like to spar with academics in Nordic literature and with linguists and professors who maybe properly study all this material and, and really go deeply into the contents. But when I read them also just as a woman, I can probably interpret these stories differently because I will easier identify with the feminine characters in those stories, even though Maybe they were written more for having, you know, an enticing male hero in them or or a sneaky Loki or like a uh, Odin figure who was like superior in his cunningness, right? And then I look at what these female characters around these gods or, uh, you know, stories are enduring. <laughs> and it's like tech and betrayal and sexual abuse you know like it's so intense it's it's insane but also uh they are feminine characters also are still in their strengths in these old stories they are also still pre-christian version in their power source of power um but yeah i felt it was necessary to have that feminine um skaldic perspective with I mean, with Scaldic perspective is to, that I make my own poetry and songs now as sort of artistic view uh, on on all of this uh, source material and this Nordic cosmos. But I have to add to this, I, I took it very freely. Like, even though the, the research has been sort of done to understand the originals of these stories, I took a lot of creative freedom for Saula to be able to tell what I wanted to tell and to make it also relevant to present time and and not just be stuck in 
Uh, I only have the source material and I can only work with that, you know, and one academic's interpretation. Like, so, so no, as artists, we luckily have and can take the freedom to say, let's, let's just work through it on our own way and make beautiful songs, which is really, really <laughs> soap opera material sometimes. And, uh, and also say our own piece. And so Saula, in a lot of moments on the album, I'm letting out thoughts that I've had for some years that I, I might have kept to myself, you know, but now in a very poetic way, I can sort of alchemize and vocalize that also to the world. And I think that's important that women learn to do that themselves, same as audio production. Learn to do it yourself so you're not also dependent on the typical male studio environment. And now I don't have to ask, can you please make the volume higher of this or that so uh, track or layer in the song? I will do it myself and, and automate it potentially better. So it's, it's, it's just, yeah, it, it is about strength also to overcome all these things that we as women have to deal with on top of just being with us what we do. Yeah, and I think it's also super important that you are doing the sound production itself because uh, to transmit your vision to someone, uh, it's especially hard when you're doing the compositing like you do. I read in your interviews, so, and we spoke like about it uh, also, that it's not a conventional song. It's probably more easier when you write uh, like 100% typical hard rock from the United States, which like was copied over and over and everybody knows that this this is a part that should be there that it should sound in a certain way but i think this genre is like it's sort of very old and at the same time it's pioneering a little bit where we are going because uh commercial music it's pretty cliche like more or less in order to be successful it has to be recognizable it has to be easily consumed and for that, uh, you have to fit certain, uh, you know, standards, certain format. And this is like, in the same time, very old uh, truths, roots like in thousand in millennia, like they got a performance on Eurovision and they took a thousand year old ballad and had to rewrite it a little bit. So it's supposed to be a song written last year <laughs> in order to fit for Eurovision. But the idea is that it's like blends, modern technique, and uh, very old roots. I read there is some kind of message about it also. You spoke about it. Yeah, you, you addressed that, you know, in sort of modern pop and music culture, there's like certain formulas about how to write music with the rules of making it easily uh, digestible and consumable. For example, with radio airplay, you know, the, I think the ideal length was three minutes and 25 seconds. So a lot of artists have actually made like the radio cut of their songs, <laughs> like making a shorter version of, of the same song. I, I, I don't do that. But I think we see actually uh, sort of like a counter uh, need or like a counter influence in, in uh, music culture. And also, of course, with the rise of this genre over the last 10 years. Uh, I think the audience actually, it's, it's not true that everybody wants to sing and that the same formula works on everyone worldwide. I think a lot of people are in need of songs that take a little bit more calm and time and demand something in that sense of the listener, but also gives a lot back. Um, and I think people like to have music that has, uh, come from a sort of niche point of interest or has been really something that an artist put a lot of effort in into creating like it's not uh, it's not an AI pop lyrics you know something that repeats the same word uh, 50 times and uh, has you know that typical earworm hook that you cannot leave your brain again <laughs> so it's 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 just it stems from a different place. It stems from thought, memory, history, and spirit. And so even in the creation process of this music, 
uh, elements were sort of insured to most to, to best capture uh, music that that stems from that place, from from something deep or, or even bigger than ourselves, like that we say we really want to have like want to give a voice also to to nature elements and and incorporate that kind of recordings in our songs as well. So I think we see actually the rise of an interest uh, that is that is different than your typical pop or rock song. And I think it's one of the reasons also why it explains that this genre has been massively growing. Um, despite people predicting that it has peaked, I actually think it has not yet. Uh, but it, but of course it adapts and changes a little. Um, and uh, you know, I've recently seen that we can now have nature as a official recognized entity on our song. So if you go to a very big streaming platform, you will now see nature as literally an artist that you can add onto your tracks if you have worked, uh, extensively with ocean sounds or bird sounds or anything that really stems from nature to give back to to uh, the preservation of it but also to recognize its role actually in music and when you see changes like this that are backed by governmental uh, institutions to sort of give back to nature conservation and to see bigger artists sort of suddenly add nature as a featured artist now on their track I think that's really a sign of the times like that means something here is being picked up by even a bigger uh, a bigger public to say hey this is something we want to acknowledge and I think us with our Nordic folk genre or Celtic folk genre everything we've been doing for the last 20 years to work with ancient cultural traditions from all over the world, to preserve folk traditional songs, to write new songs based on old literature and knowledge from old literature. I think all of us are sort of like the root of that. Uh, all of us together are the root of that rise of the interest as well. And I think it's just beautiful that everybody catches on, like. So many listeners are turning into musicians and are suddenly uh, interested to explore their own creativity and maybe have a thought project of their own, you know, with their, I mean, I think that's beautiful. You can also, it's a little much, but no, isn't that the most beautiful thing where music actually inspires creativity and the, the, the desire to create in your own listeners. I think that's the most beautiful thing. You call yourself dark folk artist. So why it's dark? Uh, yeah, I think it has to do with the way, uh, very practical. It has to do with the way I arrange and write music and what kind of tonalities I like to use. And not necessarily that we want to say it's dark because we all this thing about death and darkness and doom and gloom. That's not it. Although there's elements of that in the music. Um, I think the dark, it more has to do with to, to identify that it is also crossing over with metal niche or ambience, you know, um, more like soundscaping, dark soundscaping that we see in cinema for uh, not necessarily the most happy movies, but more like the darker <laughs> games where you have to slay yourself to victory across monsters of sorts. But but it's it's you know if I if I think about uh, and of course there are people who have studied you know like genre titles better than me, but if I think about just Nordic folk how we used to call it, um, we actually see there's such that's such a broad thing because Nordic folk can also mean the most happy dance and howling uh, tunes from Scandinavia that are really high-pitched and fiddly-diddly 
and are like really supporting a dance tradition, which is all about feasting and happiness and celebrating life. And so, of course, my music sounds very different. It really sounds a lot more moody and 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 gloomy and ceremonial or ritual sort. So, I I've titled it now dark folk because I think it it captures a little bit more the essence. Like we're more of the the moss and the root and the stone. If it were a palette, <laughs> um, and so that's that's how I I called it dark folk. And I think other people now do as well. Um, yeah, that's one of the more practical reasons. And light and dark, you know, it's, it's in any case, it's such a funny thing because it's, of course they are polarities, but they're really part of the same thing. And so I think for, for us, it's just like a very practical thing. I mean, we have Mitch Harris of Nate Palm Death on the record. We have the gold, <laughs> uh, but it's also raw raw emotion and so to add to my answer i think it maybe also has to do with the fact that we are not like polishing out every uncomfortable scene we more embrace it and say you know nature is it's part of nature it's part of life and so it isn't just uh, the merry-go-round songs here on this record it's we're going into themes like thematics like death betrayal, heartbreak, loss, illness, you know, we are not making it more pretty than it is, but we do find wisdom and teaching in topics like this and look deeper and can see that it's part of love just as much as rebirth and victory and new life is and and uh, new love or sens sensibilities. So like that, like, I think maybe that's, now that I've given it a little bit more thought, even more complete an answer to say people who identify as dark folk, they embrace all of that in life and as inspiration to their art and to their thoughts. And they don't shy away from these heavy topics. All right. I think that is a great talk. And uh, I myself got a lot of insight into what goes into music that I have huge respect for you and what you're doing like just so how do you how you do so much to record the single <laughs> sound for that la marimba and going like to, basically for a huge trip or just that it's like it just sounds so incredible and thank you for bringing this record to us to listen yeah. to us and be able to kind of be part of it Thank you, uh, uh, Katia. So this was for Stalker Magazine. Thank you so much and have a great day. Have a nice day too. Thank you for a really lovely chat. <laughs>